Welcome into another episode of First of the Floor. Ben Vallis here. Thank you for joining us. Hope you're doing well. I think we're all doing pretty well after that hilarious and timely collapse by the Milwaukee Bucks against the LeBronless Lakers last night. Alongside me, Wayne Spoonie and Jake Eisenberg. How's it going, guys? Doing good. Guys, real quick. Do you know you know who Caitlin Clark is, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think she is becoming a LeBron- LeBron-like figure to me in the hate category. Oh, no. Wow. They beat, say, say they more. Beat, yeah, they beat WVU in the second round of the women's March Madness. Oh, is that? Okay. Yeah. They shot 33 free throws. WVU oh, shot no. five. Dame what? was tweeting about it. Dame tweeted like, oh, WVU's no. getting screwed, man. So anyway, I'm doing good other than that. <laughs> That's okay. tough because I'm yeah. I, I don't I don't I like her from what I've seen from far away but um yeah obviously I, I there's nothing that she could do to me personally because <laughs> I don't the you know, Massachusetts doesn't have a WNBL NBA team and I don't have a college so yeah. um <laughs> Yeah, you got the Connecticut uh, Sun up in yeah, New yeah. England, man. Yeah, yeah. All right, as long as, long as she's yeah, that that would hurt. All right, yeah. But yeah no. I don't know about you, Jake. I've like completely latched onto WVU just like through okay. Spoonie. He's like the first college hoops person I've I've known. So I'm like that. That's my rat and die team now. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. I, I blame you. Mine's kind of Clemson. One of my best friends is from Clemson, all right. and nice. so like, uh, yeah, it was all my friends from high school went to school in America, and so. Uh, Clemson, Penn State, a few random ones that I've kind of, I went to University of Miami for a weekend. That was cool. It's a dope campus. <laughs> yeah, I visited was, there when I was looking cool, at grad school. Very cool. Yeah. Frat party, giant mansion, everybody <laughs> naked thing. Like, oh. I, can, I can understand why people like it down there. Um, yeah. That might be anyway. an off season pod right there, Jake, <laughs> yeah. hearing that yeah, story. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Naked ish. Yeah, naked ish, all right. Okay, <laughs> appropriately naked. Uh, now, look, we've got a fun one coming up. We're going to get to everyone's favorite unsponsored segment, the Schadenfreude Report. We're going to talk about the Celtics' crunch time issues and whether or not they're actually that bad. And we're going to talk about the upcoming game two of the two-game miniseries against the Atlanta Hawks. But first, a bit of housekeeping here. Hit that like button if you're here watching live on YouTube. Shout out to everybody in the chat or watching later. Subscribe to the First of the Floor YouTube channel and or audio podcast. That's going to bless us uh, with the algorithm gods and put this show in front of more people. It's also going to wash your YouTube algorithm or podcast algorithm with more Celtics content, which is always a good idea. Playback.tv slash Celtics blog. Go and sign up there. Watch live Celtics games with us, Jake, myself, Spoonie, and other folks from the Celtics blog, uh, Multiverse, Three Leaf Clover, <laughs> Spoonie's uh, weekly column on Celtics blog. What do you got for us this week, Spoonie, on Three Leaf Clover? Clover. Uh, so this week, I'm going to break down what the sh- Celtics should be doing at the end of games instead of what they are doing. Um, and a little bit of stats. I tweeted out some stats today about like their shots that I'll bring up on this pod um, in l- the last two minutes of game. So like n- a little more narrow focus than crunch time um, and just getting into the nitty gritty there. Timely. Already better yeah. time management than the Boston Celtics. Amazing. Hey-o. Uh, <laughs> Discord, merch, the links are below in the description. They're also in the podcast show notes if you're listening later. And check out the Celtics Lab and How About Them Celtics podcasts. Great podcast run by a great bunch of blokes. Uh, also under the CLNS media umbrella. So if you like this show, you're going to like them as well. So make sure you hop over to their channels and check them out. All right, guys, let's get right into it. Everybody's favorite unsponsored segment, the Shot of a Photo Report. <laughs> The Milwaukee Schmucks, guys, 124-128 loss in double OT to the LeBronless Lakers. The Bucks held a 19-point lead in the fourth quarter, a familiar tale one that Celtics fans might be familiar with. Austin Reeves had a good game, a triple-double also, a similar tale to what Celtics fans might be familiar with. Uh, but the Lakers, they had a 27-13 to fourth quarter to force the game into overtime and eventually win in double OT. Jake, I feel inclined to throw to you here first because this, oh, yeah. this is a, a Jake Eisenberg segment here. Um, how does oh, yeah. this one make you feel? How should What should Celtics fans take away from this one? This one really got me going. I got to be honest. Like This one really 
really tipped me over the edge. And I've been trying, like, trying to figure it out. You know, why does everybody freak out after a Celtics loss, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, everybody's been slobbering all over the box. They won one game against the Thunder, and every podcast like, oh my god, here they come. And I figured it out. I mean, it's essentially like whatever the thing is that rarely happens. That's what sticks out in people's minds. Celtics lose a game, people freak out. Pistons win a game. There was the NBA world was never more locked in than they were during the Pistons losing streak. So them winning a game was big news and the Bucks winning a big game and playing well against a big opponent is big news. But this, I mean, look, the lack of self-awareness from Bucks fans is truly astounding. Like, I understand wanting to come at the Celtics after they blow that Hawks game. Like, I get it. The game is the game. We're all out here for the takes. But do you not realize at this point in the season that your team's more likely than not to embarrass you 24 hours later or less? Like this, this is what's happened in the last 26 games since Doc Rivers has taken over. Blew a 19th point fourth quarter lead to the LeBronless Lakers at home yesterday. Lost to the Celtics. Blown out by 35 to the Kings. Lost to the Bron and a D-less Lakers. D'Lo goes off for 44 points. The last time D'Lo scored 40 was in 2019. Lost to the Wolves. Blown out by 35 to the Warriors. Blew a game down the stretch against the Memphis Grizzlies. Blown out by 26 against the Heat. Lost to the Suns. Blown out by the Jazz. Blew a crunch time game against the Blazers. Lost to the Nuggets. That's 12 losses in the last 26 games. Do you know how far back you have to go to find 12 Celtics losses? December fucking 4th. <laughs> That's how far back you have to go to find 12 Celtics losses. Four the Bucks, months. <laughs> four months. The Bucks are frauds. Their Mickey Mouse ring is, is nonsense. They would never have been anywhere near the finals if not for a Kyrie ankle and a hardened hamstring. They played the... Trey Young Hawks in the conference finals. They got to play Chris Paul led Phoenix Suns and DeAndre Ayton in the finals. Mickey Mouse ring, and then they turn around and say that, oh my God, we would have won that Celtics series if we had Middleton, while not realizing they wouldn't have sniffed the conference finals, let alone the finals, if not for the decimation of the Brooklyn Nets. Oh, and by the way, Dame has shot under 40% from the field in 29 games this year. That's 43% of all of his games shooting below 40%. They're frauds. Fuck the box. We're going to the finals. <laughs> I don't know how the hell I follow that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, fuck the box. We're going to the finals. Uh, this game was like the morning Bloody Mary after you had too many drinks. And that like the, the Hawks loss was, you know, I got way too drunk for how old I am. I puked a little bit. And then you wake <laughs> up and you get the hair of the dog. And you're like, all right, I'm starting to feel pretty good again all of a sudden. Here we go. It was like such a vintage Doc Rivers coach team performance yes. where he's just like confused as the leads melting away and basically does nothing different and they just completely fall apart. It reminded me a bit of game six uh, in our, our second round series against the Sixers mm. where it's like Tatum's going nuts and they're just like letting it happen. They're not like throwing <laughs> doubles at him. He hits two threes, he hits three, he hits four and Doc's like, oh, what did just happen? Like someone just punched him in the face. So it just man, <laughs> I needed that because that Hawks game that kind of got me down. It like I know it means yeah. nothing and it was not a big deal, and we were missing both of our starting guards. But that's just a shitty way to lose. Totally. Uh, but thanks, Bucks. You just always count yeah. on Bucks to like completely embarrass themselves immediately after we do. <laughs> yeah, after any Celtics game, and you know, in this case, after a loss to the Hawks, for me, it's sigh, deep sigh. Control T, new tab, twitter.com. All right, let's see what the discussion is. And yeah. you just knew what was coming, the avalanche of negativity after that Hawks mm -hmm. game. And then the knowledge of having to wait two days before a shot at redemption. And you know that the Celtics, are, I would hope so, are going to bring it and bring a, their full force of, of vengeance against the Hawks in the second game. Um, but for the Bucks to lose in this fashion after dancing on our grave, after that loss to the Hawks, uh, really it shortened the window of suffering for Celtics fans. So, so for that, good. I'm appreciative. Uh, and it's just it's just hugely uh, meaty bone for the Schadenfreude report, exactly what we needed to, to get this segment um, up off the ground again. So good stuff. <laughs> I was so excited, dude, when that thing, because I, I was watching it all on delay. And so like, I, I'm watching this thing go down. I'm watching late. I'm like, no way, no way. I'm like, oh my God, I've missed out on the party on online, apparently, once I finally got to overtime and then double overtime. Yeah, and then you add the the fact that they had to play double overtime. Like, mm -hmm. if you're going to lose, you may as well just lose in regulation. It's yes. like, you're adding Idiots. double overtime. Yeah, dumbasses, <laughs> dude. Why don't you lose like the Celtics, like real men, 
take the take the next two days off <laughs> yeah. in regulation. Yeah, take the L. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like Dame, Giannis, I mean Dame, Brook, and Middleton all aging, and like you have to play like they, everybody was dead at the end of that game, and it's like now they got it, and and these games matter so much more to the Bucks. Like yeah. now they fall a, even closer towards uh, the three, and like. Am I wrong? But like, are they like st- sneaky in danger of falling into like the four or five? Like, they're only two and a half games up on the four seed right now. It's like not not what you want at all. Like these games definitely matter for them purely for the standings perspective, but also can they play good for a week in a row before the rest of the fucking media goes? Look at them go. Like, like the, the Celtics were twenty and two, or, or what is it, twenty and they're three? Tw- <laughs> 20 yeah, and three? 20 and three. What are we which, doing, dude? <laughs> which is a 71 win pace over yeah. a full season. I did the mm-hmm. math today. So the Celtics last 23 games, yeah. they're winning at a 71 win pace and the Bucks are 500 essentially. And they're crowning the Bucks. But the hubris oh, yes. of Bucks fans. I remember I that I Kyrie season when it was all falling apart and the clean team yep. clearly hated each other. I was not dancing on graves. I was like, man, this feels like it's going to, like fail catastrophically in the playoffs Mm -hmm. but these dudes they don't give a shit they're out there like oh the celtics lost ha 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 you're like dude your team has a negative net rating in march like maybe look in the mirror a little (laughs) bit Uh, but i just i can't believe that they set themselves up for these disappointments like i would be a little more humble on the internets uh if that was my team yeah, and this gassing up Middleton as well, where you only have to watch a couple of Bucks games to notice the pattern of any time they have a crucial defensive possession, Middleton is firmly on the bench and nowhere to be seen out on the court because mm-hmm. his defense is dog shit. Um, so shout out to Bucks fans. Thank you for the content. One more point on the Shard of Freighter report before we move away from Shard of Freighter and we'll talk about some injury stuff, which we want <laughs> to make sure is properly decoupled Correct. from from the Shard of Freighter report. But the Heat got handily defeated by the Golden State Warriors yesterday. And I believe this is the Heat commentator, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong, anointed us the champions of the 2022 NBA season. Andrew Wiggins, a guy who averaged 18 points and nine rebounds a game in the 2022 NBA Finals, which they lost to the Celtics. Two years ago, it was Boston in six to, to win it all. One point heat lead with under a minute left in the... So you assume the gap in the middle is like the producer being like, nah, man, that is not what happened at all. And then he somehow comes back and doubles down down on that take, (laughs) which is completely insane. Um, I don't know where to go with this Spoonie other than like what was going through this guy's mind. Um, It feels I toyed with my emotions a little bit because obviously it brings up some bad memories of what could have been. But what's going on here? I I have no idea, um, but... I, that's a reality I'm now choosing to live in yes. uh, from here on <laughs> forward. So, uh, but yeah, I think like when you talk for 82 games for like two and a half hours, like that's just a lot of talking. You're just going to be like out of it one day. You know what I mean? Like I have bad <laughs> days at work. Yeah. Like this dude mm-hmm. just not having a good brain day at work. You know, it happens, yep. but uh, uh, did, yeah. don't really appreciate yeah, right Exactly. <laughs> but it does kind of suck to like bring that up and it got some news and like people yeah. are posting it everywhere. And it's like, ah, ugh. Yeah, Sam, Sam S. Vandiari, like <laughs> yeah. co-host of the Light Years Pod, he tagged me, being like, "Congratulations, Jake Eisenberg." I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> this is great. Can't can't wait to chase Ben and 19 this upcoming uh, playoffs. It's very exciting. <laughs> the second title of the Tatum and Jalen era is is coming coming soon." Yeah, hang the banner with just like a little asterisk at the bottom yeah. as per the yeah. Miami Heat commentator. <laughs> 2022 champions. That's right. All right. Now let's get to some news from our, our closest rivals and opponents, uh, but not part of the Shard of Frodo report. The first one, Patrick Beverly, it seemed to announce on his pod. I haven't heard the clip yet. I've just read several tweets and, and Reddit posts about it. He announced that he has torn ligaments in his wrist and is weighing up surgery options and is most likely going to be out for the season which puts the Milwaukee Bucks in a position where they have uh, seemingly no backup point guard. They lose someone who's maybe come in and gassed up their defense. If not the actual defense, then their um, motivations defensively, you might say. Um, Jake, what does this news bring to, to your mind as far as how it affects the Celtics? Like, they, they need all the players they can get, really. Like, so this is obviously, like, not good. But all of the numbers from Pat Bev, like, on-off net rating stuff, they're pretty bad. So I, I didn't think this was like a huge deal. But then this guy tweeted, uh, he's a, a Bucks guy, 
Cream City, I believe is his podcast. Wow, Bucks don't have a backup point card. Just lost the life and soul of the defense. This is a huge loss, much bigger than people likely think. Wow. I legit couldn't tell if that was satire or not. Like, <laughs> I, I like I, I couldn't, but I, I think he's being serious. Because from what, from what I tell, like, Pat, Pat Bev's washed. And I actually think that, like, him being on the roster gives Doc kind of like a crutch in that he'll kind of keep going back to Bev, even if he's, like, not effective because he's a veteran. And that's kind of what Doc does. The problem with the Bucks is, I, like, what, what does this mean? Is like, do you play more Andre Jackson or Marjan Beauchamp or AJ Green? It's like, AJ Green? AJ Green? But, uh, yeah, like, yeah. I, or Pat Connaughton. So I don't think it really matters because they're all kind of the same player to me. But if that's tr- actually true, then obviously we don't want to see injuries. And I've talked about my respect for, for Patrick Beverly's career. But, like, if that makes the Bucks worse and that's objectively good, for the Celtics, and that's just the reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Pat Bev can kind of defend certain types of guys, and he can make some shots. And like when you have you look at that Bucks bench, like it, it appears Ty Ty Washington is like the only real point guard on the bench now, and he flamed out in one of the worst Houston Rockets teams like of all time. Like he couldn't even make that roster. Um, I'm even sure he's on a full contract. I think he might be on a two-way for them. So they just don't have a lot of options. And at least Pat Bev in a playoff series, you know he's playable. Um, he might not be, like, positive. He might be negative. <laughs> but uh, compared to some of these, like, unknown young guys who aren't really ball handlers or Pat Connaughton, who I think has been playing a little bit better recently but's had a pretty bad year, um, yeah, they just really lack depth all over the place. And Doc's doesn't do depth any favors. I mean, he's not real creative with how he uses like deep bench guys. Um, so it's bad news for the Bucks. It sucks sucks for Pat Bev. As much as I hate him on the court, when I see clips of his podcast, he does come off quite likable. So he seems yes. like a pretty good dude off the court. So that it's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I suppose as far as it ha- how it pertains to the Celtics and potentially this playoff matchup, these new rules of the NBA are um, un- unwilling to acknowledge of, of more better allowed physicality uh, defensively. That obviously benefits a player like Pat Bev, who has made a career out of being really physical yeah. and tenacious defensively. He's now not a presence in a potential playoff series against the Bucks. So as much as we despise injury and we want Pat Bev to get uh, better as soon as possible, that takes the pressure off, I think, our guards and... And potentially, you, know, you think about guards getting switched onto KP, and no matter how small they are, KP does have trouble with that added physicality, which we're going to get to a little bit later. Pat Bev out of the equation obviously makes life a little bit easier for the Celtics. So it's that weird situation where obviously you don't wish injury on anyone. You hope that they get better soon, but you immediately recognize, you know, it does ease some of that pressure, I think, defensively on the Celtics if we do see the Bucks in the playoffs. Speaking of the playoffs, I'm going to use this to segue to some Joel Embiid news as well. This is the current East playoff picture so we've got the Pacers in sixth and they have per uh, I can't remember the name of the website playoffseating.com or playoff, playoff status playoff, playoff status thank you Jake a 41% chance of holding the sixth seed or a 27% chance of dropping to the seventh seed in seventh place the Heat they're 39 and 33 at the moment so one loss back from the Pacers they have a 37% chance of holding on to that seventh seed or a 22% chance of climbing to the sixth then we've got in eighth the eighth seed, eighth seed rather, the Sixers, too many numbers, uh, who are 39 and 33, so very close to the Heat there. The ninth seed, we've got the Bulls, and 10th, we've got the Hawks. So as it stands currently, the Heat would be in that, that play-in um, pool, if you will, along with the Sixers, the Bulls, and the Hawks. Jake, I know you're like, you know, um, captain of the ship of we want to avoid the Heat at all costs. How does this current play-in slash playoff picture make you feel? We're gonna play the Heat in round one. Yeah, <laughs> like, like they mm-hmm. are—they're the worst, dude. Like they're like like what? Is, Jimmy Butler's just not even playing. Like they just like they just don't seem to give a shit, dude. And it's like one of the—they're gonna fall out of the playoffs one of these years, like completely. And they're gonna mm-hmm. lose. Like, they're gonna lose both playing. Like they almost did this last year. So like that's the that's the big hope, right? Is that they just completely fall out? And I mean, I, I'll talk about the MB news now, just because like parlays with this point right here is that um, Woj was just on um, TV talking about how they expect him to be back when, not if. And Nick Nurse today is saying there's a very good likelihood that uh, Embiid's back before the start of the playoffs slash play-in. 
he's going to be back on on Simmons's podcast. He was saying the same thing that he's going to be back. The Sixers fans that I've um, interact with, they're all, all kind of the same information. A lot of Celtics fans in our Discord are just believe that MB is not going to come back, which is. I think possible, totally, but I think all signs are pointing to him coming back. I'm going to guess like three to five games before the regular season ends. And if he's healthy enough-ish, and like the conditioning's not going to be that much of an issue in like that context, last five games and then a play-in game, I'd be pretty surprised if they don't just win that play-in game because that's kind of where he can be really good. It's like, okay, one game, it's not the constant burden, the conditioning's not going to pick up potentially I could see him destroying even if like whoever the, if the paces do fall in 41% sounds like a lot because it's a lot higher than the other numbers but that's obviously still you know they're still giving a 38% chance that they fall into the seven or the eight seed so like still very good chance they fall in there as well I think Embiid just would destroy the, the paces in a one game um or the heat as well like I think that's very possible in a one game scenario which pushes the heat into the eight seed I think that to me seems like the most likely scenario right now. And then we're mm-hmm. going to have to rely on either the Bulls or the Hawks to beat the Heat in the playing, which is like legitimately possible. Like the Heat aren't good enough where like that's not out of the realm of possibility, clearly, because yeah. it almost happened last year. But I think, I mean, you know, I don't know how much everybody believes in the power of the universe, but <laughs> if you do believe in it, then you're probably feeling like more likely than not right now, we're going to get the Heat in round one. What do you think, Spence? The Bucks swept the Heat on their way, yeah. at avenging, I think, a first round knockout. They sw- no, the a bubble. second round knockout in the bubble, and then avenged that with a first round sweep of the Heat when they won yep. the title. So, uh, you know, universe, maybe, I raise yeah. you. I see you, and I raise you another one. Yeah. All right, I yeah, like one it. of Tatum's watches. Um, there you go. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I will never cheer for a non-Celtics team more than I will cheer for the Chicago Bulls or Atlanta Hawks oh my God. when they play the Miami Heat in that play-in game. Like, I will be, I might just drive up to Chicago, and or I guess it'd be in Miami. Damn it, that's too far away. But. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, so, go ahead, Well, I was, I was going to say, secondarily, like, the sub the subplot here is the Embiid playing the Bucks in round yes. one. Is That's like, right. That would be huge. Pretty See, I, I would I, I phrase it this way because that's just the trap we've fallen into as fans. I would rather face the Heat in the first round if it meant that we got to see an Embiid, Giannis, Bucks, Sixers right. match up in the first round as well in that two seven spot. So it's a sacrifice we have to be willing to make to take on the Heat in order to see those guys just take each other to seven games, hopefully, and exhaust each other, assuming we do get by the Heat and see one of them, most likely Giannis, down the road. So what an insane this- thing. Jesus. Do we think I this don't. is like the one time Embiid might get stronger as the playoffs go on, as he like plays himself into better shape? Like that's the one thing I'm thinking. He's gonna yeah. be so friggin' out of shape in that first round that's playoff series. It's like, do you just want him then? You can just run him off ball screens and make him like guard in space and just blow by him. But at that, I don't know. I think I I would trade that for that Giannis Embiid series. Mm-hmm. I want it. I know. I know. Sixers fans want it bad. Like they're convinced that they would win that series for a variety of reasons. I think principal being Doc Rivers and uh, the fact that the Bucks aren't good. That 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 part yeah. too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not a bad call. Well, look, when we come back, we're going to talk about the Celtics' crunch time issues and whether or not they're truly that bad. But first, here's a quick word from our sponsor. The NBA playoffs are coming and the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's these sad little teams that haven't locked up the number one seed and are fighting for seeding or tournament season, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Prize Picks even offers injury insurance so that your entries stay live even if one of your players gets injured. For basketball games, if you have a player who exits in the first half and does not return in the second, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. Porzingis sitting on a back-to-back, you know we're going for more on Horford points, rebounds, and assists. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Definitely check out Prize Picks. You can download the app as well. If you do sign up, use the code CLNS. You can support us and all the other CLNS shows by by doing so. So if you want to support the show, if you want to supplement your hoops viewing experience, check out Prize Picks. It's a, a lot of fun. And make sure you use the code CLNS on sign up. Now, the Celtics crunch time issues. 
are they really that bad? Oh, my three-minute, very shallow preliminary research and data mining suggests maybe, yes, maybe it is that bad. So the 2023-24 Celtics are in crunch time. 20-11, and 11, pretty good, with a net rating of 19.1, which is good for sixth in the league. And for reference there, the Bucks, who we saw shit the game down their legs last night against the <laughs> Lakers, are 23-13, and 13, good for third, uh, at least in terms of win-loss record in crunch time. Uh, the Celtics post-All-Star break, however, 2-3 and three in crunch time game, so under 500 with a net rating of minus 7, good for 19th uh, in all rankings post-All-Star break. They're also dead last in pace on the year in crunch time, which I think is probably the stat that jumps off the page the most and also the most obvious one. I've got the clip here from one of the final possessions against the Hawks. You could be forgiven for thinking that this clip was being played back to you in slow motion. It is not. And it's everyone just meandering up the court. KP sets this like nothing screen for Tatum, which just gets them nothing. KP tries to set another screen. It's soft. They get nothing out of that. The Hawks do a really good job of switching, and it ends up in a contested step-back three for Jalen Brown. So they just took forever to get into that. When they got into that, they were meandering on the screens and and the actions, and they were sort of soft in their approach and their execution there. Um, Just terrible. So while they're well and truly above 500 in crunch time games, it seems like they've gotten worse and slower in their execution as the season has gone on. However, and I promise I'll shut up soon, the 2008 Celtics, those guys who won the title in 2008, they were 24 and 13 in crunch time, also sixth in the league at that point, with a net rating of just 1.4, and their offense in crunch time was ranked 25th overall. The 2017 Golden State Warriors were 25th in crunch time win loss record with a 7.4 net rating. Uh, and actually, the Celtics, uh, was, I think that was the last Isaiah Thomas year, were first in net rating of that year. Suffice to say, your crunch time execution and your rankings subsequently don't have to be top of the table for you to be a championship caliber team. That said, crunch time is what we're putting under the microscope for this segment. And like, let's just be honest, it doesn't look that great. I don't know who wants to, to take the next uh, stab <laughs> here, but that's what I got. Go, Spoonie. I... I don't think it looks that bad statistically. Mm -hmm. I mean, like our net rating plus 19.1 in crunch time is that's really friggin' good. Um, The minus seven recently is bad. My guess is like, that's pretty small minutes Um, on the pace thing. I think that's the stat that truly is infuriating. Um, But I think part of that is like the Celtics very often are, in the lead in yes. crunch time, whereas lots of teams probably are trying to catch up. So they're playing faster. So that, that goes into it. But like, we all have eyes. Like they're obviously playing way too friggin' slow in crunch time. Mm-hmm. Even if you can explain away, like they should be 28th in pace and not dead last. But I don't think they're bad if it's like a five point game with like four minutes left, but it's like the last two minutes really bite nail biting time is when I think that they really struggle. So I did a, I, I, deep dove into some stats today we've attempted 46 shots when the score's within three and there's two minutes or less in the game we are shooting under 40 percent on twos but 39 percent on threes all of the made threes are assisted we have not made a pull-up three uh <laughs> when it's within three under two minutes at the rim 55 percent short mid-range 50 percent Corner three, four of six. Above the break, three of 12. Long mid-range, one of nine. That sounds right. Yeah, and I think we all know who is probably to blame for that <laughs> one of nine. Peyton Pritchett. Uh, so, like, That's yeah, right. God damn it. Yeah, <laughs> Peyton would probably out of the smash that shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, I just think it's like, we're really good at when we actually try to generate good looks, corner threes, shots at the rim, short mid-range area, which, you know, late game, that's not a bad look at all. But when we settle for long mid-range above the break threes, we are terrible at it. And it just goes to like back to that frustrating thing is like, you guys know how to generate these good shots. We just watched it for 46 minutes. Just keep doing that. Uh, And I get there's a balance that you don't want to turn it over, but there's also a balance of like, yeah, that clip's a great, great example, Ben, of like, they're just not doing things with force. 
They're going through the motions. And this is the last time you should be going through that. Like, go through the motions in the first quarter, boys. Mm -hmm. But um, so something needs to get fixed. But I I had like a a Zen moment this morning when I was drinking my morning coffee. I trust Joe Missoula to fix it. I really think okay. he will. I think last game was like going to be the breaking point. I think they'll do better from here on out. It's funny. Like with last game in particular, I'm just like, I'm kind of whatever with it. Cause I think it was just so obviously bad. Like you, you you're going to watch film for five seconds and be like, yeah, that was a disaster. There's yeah. no Derek White. And what's funny with all of these, Records with and without players. KP, we're like 17 and 3. No, Jalen, we're undefeated. Tatum, we've lost only one. But Derek White has missed six games and we're 3 and 3 in those Derek White games. It's just like he is so important and especially in these moments. Dr. Germ Scary in the chat here. I bet Derek White made all those clutch shots. Derek White has been insane in the clutch. Yeah, he's at like 47% from three in the clutch. He's massively important in the clutch. And like you talked about those minutes, Spoonie. So two and three, that's in that's 17 total minutes over those five games. So like the sample size is, is, is insanely small. So from, from a statistics perspective and Ben, you're on it. Like all those teams, you just don't have to be good to win a title in the clutch. Phoenix Suns were the best crunch time team in the NBA. The year they went to the finals and lost to the, lost to the Bucks and went through a Mickey Mouse uh, run as well through the playoffs like you just don't have to be and you guys have been everyone here we've all been through the last couple of playoff runs where crunch time has not been it's just not a strength like this team is so good at everything and this is why we come back to this is because it's like they're number one or number two or number three in just like everything with a bullet you like you name the thing and they're just elite at it and it's just like the one thing and it's like it's a glaring thing because one it's the only thing they're not good at and obviously it matters when it comes down to, to big moments, and you remember big moments, going back to my point at the top, you remember things that don't happen very often. And as long as don't lose games very often, and they don't do this very often. My, I think my point with this is like, this team is better. And so it's like, they're better in the clutch than they have been the last couple of years. You can go back and look at all the blown leads in the Udoka season, way more, way worse in the, in the clutch. This team is better in clutch time, better defensively, better offensively in a variety of ways. So it's like, yes, I, I think it's okay to be like, this is not a strength of this team. I think they can be better. And I kind of write off this post all-star break thing as well. It's like right now to beat this else, you kind of have to trick them. You've got to mm-hmm. be, you've got to be down 20 in the fourth yeah. quarter. And then you might be able to come back. And you know, cause the Celtics are like, fuck it, dude, it's March. <laughs> this is, this is why we do this. <laughs> I, I feel better already. That was, that was great. Uh, I, I will also <laughs> add that like not all crunch times are the same. So correct exactly. me if I'm wrong, but the, the parameters or the criteria for crunch time is within five points and within or five minutes or less to go. Mm-hmm. And how we arrived at that point in this Hawks game is the Celtics had been up by 30. And as we approached that five minutes to go mark, the Hawks had been on this massive run to get the game close and therefore had all of the momentum. It wasn't this tit for tat game was on a knife's edge, super close the whole way through with both teams exchanging punches, it was the Hawks had all the momentum arriving at that point, uh, which I think you could attribute to the Celtics' lack of pace and momentum at that point as well. Do you know what I mean? Like it it wasn't the recipe for that particular crunch time um, circumstances was was different to others that we've seen, say, against the the Wolves or the Nuggets so far this season. Same as the Cavs game. Yeah. yeah, and they had some really good crunch time possessions. Like they had that nice Tatum drive for a dunk. Like it wasn't all a disaster. It's just those like last two or so bad that those are the ones like the Tatum turnover and then the Jalen. I don't. I don't. The controller yeah. shut off. Like whatever. It almost went was. in, dude. It was just hilarious. Like it's yeah. so funny. Yeah, like yeah, there's five. Almost got the rebound. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> there's five possessions, right? The Tatum dunk. The Tatum pull up on the left elbow, mm-hmm. and Jalen also hit a shot from the left elbow too. So it's like. Those five possessions, they actually went three for five. Right. They were disaster. B- bad process. Agreed. But, it's, and like, but, you know, you zoom out just a tiny bit. It's like, actually, not so bad. That Tatum dunk goes into the I Derek know. White put back Chamber of Secrets, <laughs> buried on the ground with all the other great moments in losses. That was such Jaylen a sick Brown dunk. Dunking on um, uh, Maxi Kleber on KG's retirement night. Loss. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yep. Exactly. 
one day after we've won Banner 18, we'll, we'll kick back with a two-hour <laughs> pod and, and watch through Because suddenly, like, those moments are yeah. revived. It was all Doesn't on matter. the road yeah. to the championship. But right <laughs> yep. now, they have to be buried, unfortunately. But that was a sick deep. dunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very deep. All right. Well, look, we'll, we'll end with some news of the day. And we'll get to this Hawks game tomorrow, which I think we all hopefully assume is going to be a blowout as the, as the Celtics kick back um, after that very disappointing loss and hopefully we get a, a Jason Tatum make up a dunk in a win on that one but Jason Tatum appeared on I don't know the name of the show this is the level of research that goes into this podcast guys the the post game show on TNT and got stuck in this one-on-one conversation with Shaq about whether Tatum would try and dunk on him in a real game situation we saw in the playoffs your epic dunk against LeBron Oof. a couple years back we saw we've seen like you get people in this generation Back in the old days, would you have tried Shaq coming down the lane? No. No. Oh, Not he's looking him. straight in your... Would you have tried <laughs> no, him? No, that answer is no. You would have tried him? No. Well, hold on, Shaq. He, why he would said you yes. I'm asking you, Jason. You? I'm not asking you. He, love, said, he said no, he answered. I love his mom. I love his dad. I, love, said, I love this little man, but he know I would have put him on the ground. He said he would try you, though. I would have tried. That's what he no, said. he wouldn't have tried. I'm just... No, okay. only been dunked on twice in 20 years. There's a reason for that. Relax. Only I'll twice? You, I'll put you down. You <laughs> oh, no, I'm trying. <laughs> don't do it. I'm don't, telling don't, you. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Twice. Only twice? But you would have gone for it. I ain't scared, yeah, Shaq. Come you on gotta now. Try. You got to try. You got to try. You have to. He feels catch obligated one to try. Exactly. He said he'd catch you slipping. So, Leighton help side. Slow news, eh? So, <laughs> we're, we're running with this. But Shaq walking towards him in sort of a semi-threatening stance. Like, I think he's wearing sketches as well, some sort of ankle yeah. supporting geriatric shoe or footwear. Um, I don't know. Do you guys think that Tatum would try and dunk on Shaq? It's a, it's a strange hypothetical, but this is where we're at. I, I technically, he would if, he, if the, pres- the situation presented itself, but I think Shaq's probably right. I don't know. How, I don't know if Jason's, it's not really his game, dunking on people like Shaq. That's more yeah, of Jalen. Jalen would try it. Oh, yeah. He would have done it already. Yeah. What do you think, Spoons? Yeah. JT like dunks around people, not really like on their heads like JB does. So, and there's no getting around Shaq, especially at this age where he's widened out a bit as well. So, um, but you, dude, Jared Greenberg is tall, man. I, yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. I just assumed he was short, but he's like, you got to be like 6'3, six, 6'4. Six, he's like Jamal Crawford's height, uh, which Wait. is what I took away from that clip. But yeah, is that I thought Shaq Jared was going to murder. Him. Isn't that left Because that is. Oh, is that left? Oh, is it the guy on the, the guy on the left next to Shaq? Yeah, <laughs> that's the left guy. I was like, who's who's Jared Greenberg? Isn't he? He's like the NBA TV guy, right? The, yeah, the guy that does get up host. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that guy's yeah. short then. Anyway, it's not important. <laughs> I was wondering, I was like, I'm pretty sure that's left guy, but yeah, yeah you're right. right. You're right. My bad. Um, taller, taller than I thought too. Yeah. But that's awesome. Because I saw some photos of Tatum and Shaq like taking a photo and like the angles and people were like, oh, Tatum's so tall. You see the angle right there where everybody's like flat across. Mm-hmm. Shaq's so much bigger than Tatum, dude. Oh, yeah. Like, it's just not close at yes. all. Um, I have another news thing, Ben, that I don't think it's on the run sheet before we get to okay, the great. Hawks thing that I didn't have time to upload. But um, all the Celtics, a bunch of the Celtics went to the main uh, team, play against the Atlanta team. And like Hauser was there, Derek White was there and... Jordan Walsh got interviewed by uh, by Noah, who we got to get on the podcast. Yeah. But Noah was like talking to Walsh and he's like, I love seeing these guys come and see that I'm like not a bum and that I can actually hoop. And I, I just enjoyed that. Everybody like went and, you know, watched him and he was super excited to have them there. It's like, I don't know if you ever got, if you guys ever played like varsity or junior varsity. It's like, if you're on junior varsity and the varsity team watches you, it's sick. And if you're on varsity and you watch the JV team, you're like, you're super hyped for them and you can tell yeah. they really appreciate you guys being there. Like these guys aren't that much older than, the, than those guys anyway, right. especially Walsh, <laughs> right? He's like 19. So yeah, uh, I'm sure he would have loved it. Yeah. Uh, amazing. I, I once went on a basketball tour of, of New Zealand, which is like the, the, the peak of my high That's school uh, basketball playing days. And I was in the B squad, you know, untalented as I am hey, we'll uh, athletically it. speaking. And uh, yeah, the A squad would hang around and watch our games afterwards, which uh, meant everything on, on the odd occasion where I would score or do something that made it look like I was a competent uh, athlete, they would all cheer. So I, I get those vibes. That, that's <laughs> awesome, man. It kind of, it's an extension of that, that plane shot, uh, sort of pre Lamar Stevens yeah. tray, where it was a photo of, of the team posing together on the, on the plane. This is just another iteration of that, right? Just another, 
another example that this team has galvanized um, to the, you know, like most championship teams are. Obviously, it's a stretch to make that connection that if they show up to a G League game, it means they're going to win the title. Um, but they've left no doubt that at least the chemistry side of things is completely taken care of. I was just going to say, in that game that they did watch, the main Celtics did beat the College Park Skyhawks 127 to 112. Jordan yeah. Walsh had 19, nine boards, one assist, one turnover. Did go one for five from three, which um, is tough. But, man, Cater out here, dude, just killing people. Nine for 11, nine boards, three assists, three blocks. And then Beast. J- JD, 13 and eight, uh, three steals. Drew Peterson quietly 0 for 7 from the... Oh, Jaden Springer, 26 points. 11 for 18 with six rebounds, three assists. All right. We've got a few guys who exist in that groove, um, that chasm between the G League and the NBA where they're they're too good for one and and just not good enough for the other, uh, which makes for a really dominant G League team, apparently. They've been awesome. I've been watching the highlights pretty consistently um, throughout the season, and they've they've been fantastic. Hopefully, we'll see some of them in Vegas for, uh, for Summer League in July. Yeah, it's like the quadruple A players in baseball. Like the yeah. <laughs> are too good for triple A, not good enough for the big leagues. And yep. yeah, it re- really makes you appreciate when Springer looks like an all star and then he gets yeah. on the court and he looks like he's never dribbled a basketball before in the NBA. <laughs> it's like it's these crazy. dudes are such an, a crazy level. Yeah. Jesus, dude. Like so Springer let's... 11 for 18? Nuts. Yeah. Not bad. Never. Not bad at all. <laughs> never. <laughs> let's. Let's wrap on this. The Hawks, who we play tomorrow in Atlanta again, are up seven on the Blazers while the Celtics just chill out, go to G League games and presumably play in golf and, and who knows what else. Um, predictions for this game. I know we, pr- we pretty much hit on that already, Jake, but how do you think this one's going to go tomorrow? All uh, right. So injury report wise, I think we've got, um, do we have it here? We do. No, oh, we do. Do you want to, uh, we there got, we go. uh, I know Drew, Questionable, Horford questionable, Springer questionable, Tilt, which is funny because Springer played yesterday. But um, my guess is we don't see Al or Drew. The big toe sprain is like, that's just code for Al's not playing tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And and Drew, I mean, that's just, I think it's just great news. The, the biggest news of the week probably is that Drew Holiday has been moved to questionable for the shoulder after people deep diving into dead arm surgery potential options um, at the end of the season. And so that's huge. Um, get Derek White back up, but I expect them to come out pretty focused. Um, but I don't know who. I, Marge's of is a mess, dude. We got freaking Jalen Green playing for the Rockets, like dominating again, like yeah. for the first time in his career. Like, like Curry. Yeah, March is like this this period right now. You just have to just throw it away for the most part. Like if your team, like the Celtics, had, doesn't have anything to play for, like we did the pod where we're looking for things like to enjoy. Reading too much into anything, like from big picture wise, is, is a mistake. But like, you know, little things like Pritchard and stuff playing well—that's really what we're we're kind of looking for. Um, these guys, these guys have proved what they're what they're capable of and what they can do and what they should do. Six game lead on the Western Conference at this point. Like, we're a couple of wins away from locking this whole thing up. Yeah, I wonder if they come out like that got knocked in their pride a little bit with that. Atlanta lost and come out and just kill them is kind of what I expect, even though, yeah, you're right, Jake. Like, it is totally meaningless for them. Like, they got such a big cushion even on the West that the the goal is to not have anyone get hurt. And can the refs, like, call it, like, call fouls at some point? Like, I was afraid somebody was going to get hurt in that Atlanta game. Like, Wesley Matthews was, like, out to hit people, dude. Like, he, there was so much contact on every off ball action we had it was crazy man at one point he just like two hands on sam hauser was trying to set a screen and like pushed him up to the three-point line it was crazy so don't get hurt try and get a win i i do think they're gonna come out whip ass though Uh, I, I, i think so can we see KP just get in a little bit more of a rhythm? I know you guys yeah. aren't necessarily like along on the ride with me here, but <laughs> he's, he's just come back from the hamstring thing. But I, I am a little worried. And, you know, after this, we're going to record our underrated plays video, which will be up on our YouTube channel in a, in a couple of days. But he has looked like he has struggled with that added level of physicality. Those fouls that the refs are no longer calling. And so I'd love to see him just begin to to grow used to that because you know what basketball environment is incredibly physical where less fouls are called it's the playoffs and they're right right around the corner so like now's the time for kp to adjust to this and i just i'd love to see a nice healthy stretch of kp just like getting those switches 
and kind of dominating out of them because he just hasn't been doing that since he's been back. Um, my scale of worriness from zero to Ben Vallis is like three. Um, okay. So I'm not all the way up there yet, but it's, it's beginning to, to rise a little bit. Mm-hmm. Come on. I, I would like that too. Absolutely. No question. Let's get KP, you know, 20 and five tomorrow and just on like a nice efficiency game. All right, yeah, book it. it. That's going to do it for this one. Thank you so much for joining us. Hit that like button, subscribe. You guys know the drill. Spoonie, Jake, love your work, guys. Until next time, go Celtic. I love the Celtics!